So, the big question is this. How can runners like you, who aren't professional athletes or paid sponsored runners, fix, heal, and correct lingering run injuries so you can enjoy your passion for running for the rest of your life? That is the question. And on RunPainFreePodcast.com, your host, Jessica Marie Rose Leggio, gives you the answers. All right, everyone, welcome to the injury analysis for episode 101 Bone Density Podcast. And this is herniated discs and back pain, which is huge. So let's get right into it. This is where people mostly feel low back pain. Basic things like just picking up a box or vacuuming. These are basic movements in life that people don't realize that they're doing all day long that are actually considered very active. Housework is very active. Then we have the standing desk and the sitting desk, which is actually a real issue. People get standing desks thinking that that's going to take care of the sitting all day. Well, you can't do either completely. You need a variation of both. So you're going to have back pain either way you take it. Sitting, you're going to have more low back pain and standing, you're going to have more like of a hip pain because you're going to wind up sitting into one hip or the other most of the time. So why is that? You have patterns in your body and your IT IT band pattern, which is actually iliotibial tract. We're going to get into that in a second. I am no longer going to conform to social vocabulary. <laughs> There's no such thing about an IT band. It's an iliotibial tract. And the pattern of that tract, if you see on the bottom, those are all fascia patterns and how the body moves. So when you just raise your arm overhead, a hundred things happened for that to happen. Not just a muscle fire and a joint fire. A pattern in the fascia system allows it or disallows it or makes it compromise to allow it. And so at the top picture you'll see, you'll see it crossing over. So right hip is left shoulder and left hip is right shoulder. And the IT pattern actually crosses. So it comes from your outer calf all the way up your outer quad crossing 80% of your glute and then attaching and going across to your opposite shoulder. So when you pull your left shoulder forward, you're actually tugging on your right hip, on your right knee. And when you pull your left, when you pull your right shoulder forward, you're tugging on your left knee. And that's how that works. So when someone is trying to move basic mechanics, which is walking or running, uh, it's going to pull and tug across that spine. If your spine feels there's an instability all of the muscles around it are going to lock up to protect it. Why? It is the most important structure in the body, which is more than likely why the spine is where they test bone density and your hips. Those are the two pockets they test. So here is why it is the iliotibial tract. As you can see, there's no band. That is a that is the top, that is the superficial fascia, which you see on the bottom. That is the superficial fascia. That's the one that's over everything right underneath your skin, underneath the dermis, and it's covering everything. That is the knee right there. And there is striations of a pattern in the system all over it. But the IT pattern is the biomechanical pattern of how the body moves, period. So I wanted to show you that. And then underneath, when you take off that top layer of superficial fascia, you then have the deep fascia. Deep fascia is around all of your blood vessels, which is your arteries and veins, your nerves, inside your muscles, and around your joints. That's the second deep layer of fascia. And then the third layer of fascia is visceral fascia. That's the casing of your, like the skin of your organs, that's fascia, which are all around in the suspension of the abdominal cavity where they're all sitting and pocketing. I do not believe in digging into the abdomen to dig into that fascia because mm, organs don't need to be touched like that. So we stop at deep fascia and we work on these two things to get feedback from how the body is or is not moving. So I've used this visual a lot specifically to show how the IT goes into other tissue. I've said it a million times. I have a lot of IT band and runner's knee and all that stuff. I'm going to do a new one coming up, so pay attention to it. But I have a lot of those podcasts and I say this over and over again, but now you have visuals and you're going to consistently see this because the more I bang this into your head, the more you're going to stop thinking you snapped your IT band. It's not possible. Okay, it is a fascist system. And if you did snap your IT tract, you wouldn't be standing at all. Your whole body would just go limp. So it's a system and its job is to sense, hey, that spine is off. So I'm going to lock everything up. 
and the number one thing that's gonna lock up is your psoas. So in this you can see, what I use this picture for is because I wanted to show you that the diaphragm is right up where the psoas actually starts to attach. Now the psoas, where the top, when it says quadratus lumborum, it's the QL, that is right outside the psoas. The psoas is the long skinny muscle on either side of the spine. The lumbar spine is totally covered on the outside, not covered, but it's attached, the psoas on the entire outside of the lumbar spine, L1 to L5. The most common discs that get herniated are L4, L5, S1. So down below we have our sacrum and you can see the psoas comes down either side of the spine and attaches on the inside of the hip. Again, so this is why the psoas, in my professional opinion, is the most important muscle in the body. It attaches our body top to bottom. It is the number one hip flexor. And if this guy is locked up on your spine, you ain't going anywhere without a lot of pain. So this is where a lot of stuff people get that are really superficial pains is actually coming from. Why that is, I don't know. Go to runpainfreenow.com, apply for a consult, and I'll figure it out. So we have this is what I wanted to show you because the spine is the number one protected structure in the body. So this is your second hip flexor, the sartorius. I talk about this a lot too. The funny thing about the sartorius is it never even touches your hip, <laughs> but it's your second hip flexor. This is up top where you see it says strain. Right next to that, you can see where the sartorius, the longest muscle in the body, by the way, is attaching at what we call iliac crest. So it's not touching your hip. So you think you have hip pain because you went and deadlifted at the gym and you Google hip pain, but you actually have pain at your iliac crest. But Google's gonna spit back to you for your hip, which is way, way, way low, where the psoas is inside, way low. Where they cross right there is where you think you have a muscle called a hip flexor. No such thing. There are several muscles that make up hip flexors. This is where the two major ones actually cross. So this is what is happening and this is what's responding to your spine mobility. Everything else can break. It can tear, it can stress, it can crack, it can break. All of it, as long as that spine is safe and the hip is safe. The hip will go before the spine, but it's like hip then spine, all right? So just to understand how important the spine is. So when this is happening, when this is happening, when your spine is being pre pulled on by the psoas, the psoas goes from the back to the front. It actually creates the very deep curve in your back. No, it's not your big booty. If you got a big booty, good for you, but that's not why you actually have a big booty. You have a pull on this muscle forward that's actually pulling your back forward and creating an extra curve in your back. So it's considered a tight psoas, muscle is tightness. But it's actually doing that because it knows your spine is unstable, so it's doing everything to basically lock you up and lock up your spine. So you lack mobility in your spine. It's all one thing. Even though the L, the L1 and T12, the, the, the psoas attaches that L1, T12 is right there. So it's not irrelevant of the T-spine or the C-spine. It's not happening. So here are some excerpts from some journals considering load. Load right now is an argument in the industry because it's being flippantly used and Generally, though, sport and exercise scientists agree that training load consists of both external and internal domains, meaning something outside of you that your body has to respond to, and then actually inside how your body internally takes load and how it can endure load. Two different things. Typically, the term external training load has been referred to as a total amount of mechanical or locomotive stress generated by an athlete during an exercise, like distance traveled, running, total number of pitches thrown by a baseball player, or the number of jumps of a volleyball player undertaking. So basically, it's the repetitiveness of the mechanics, biomechanics, of how the body responds to load. Reference the podcast you just listened to in iTunes, the audio portion. If you didn't, go listen to it because that is where I talk about how the mechanical move, the mechanical mechanics of your body is where the bone density is either going to get stressed out to build or stressed out to crack. And how that's happening is very important. So flippantly running to a gym is how you get injured. So uh, there's more here and then we have another one here. So there, there's an argument right now that they want to actually ban the term load because it's being misused and misunderstood. And because, because of the level of fitness that is posted online and all these things, 
me and my peers all want to make sure everybody is working out safe. We want everybody to work out well. And so these are just excerpts of how it's more suitable to speak about it, what it means, how a part, how a how a person is is actually responding to it, and exercise performance, sport performance, in terms of what they're working or loading. So, when we have have our in per, when we used to have in person events, or even when I'm working with anybody, not the number one thing people can't do is a squat. Number one thing. Now it's not that they can't they are doing it wrong. They actually don't have spine extension because that psoas is locked up for some reason. Why? Runpainfreenow.com, apply for a consult and I'll figure it out. But so I am literally using my body weight to resist his so he feels safe to sit back into his hips because he didn't feel safe to sit back into his hips. Why? Because to properly squat, your core has to fire. Nobody's core fires. Nobody's butt fires. Everybody complains about their gut and, uh, and their butt being flat. Yet no one actually does the one move that would actually work both of those things properly because they don't have the engagement of those areas because of a spine mobility issue. Okay. So the woman behind him, if you see, she's totally in her knees, her knees are caving. You can kind of see it. If you can, I'm telling you her knees are caving. She's not sitting into her glutes. She's actually using her quads and the quads make up the majority of that move, not her glutes, not her core, and definitely not her spine. Nothing is getting to it. Nothing is building the bone density in her spine right now. Actually, she's putting more strain on her hips because she's in her quads and it's too much load on the quads for those hips to actually build because the hips need to be built via the glute and the back muscles, not the quads. So he's a veteran, actually. Do you think he thought he wasn't squatting right? No, absolutely not. He, of course, thought he was squatting right. He was amazed at how his body changed after that to our running drills because he squatted properly. So if you look at the psoas from the side, it actually pulls the back forward, which is what I was saying before. This is obviously a woman a depiction. This muscle also, ladies, is how you're able to have a baby and not break your back because this muscle allows you to build your belly. Guys with the big beer belly, same thing. This muscle is actually allowing them to build that belly out without breaking their back. But what do they all have? A very deep back, a very deep arch in their back. And what they would do is put a, like a, a weight belt on or a back belt because their core isn't countering that muscle. So the muscle is overly working, which is the deepest core muscle. It's also the most important one because it's on the spine. But your spine is being pulled on because the spine, for some reason, is unstable. And the psoas is like, got it. I'm not letting anything move. Don't. I'm going to lock up these hips. I'm going to lock up this back. Don't you worry about it, spine. And so... This is Scott on the left. He is naturally hypermobile. He is a rock climber. He had excruciating pain and a training peer that I used to work with who went on to be a physician's assistant is his sister-in-law and was like, you need to go see Jessica right away. He had to get on a plane and travel to Europe. And this is New York City, kind of a long flight. So he came to me and he signed up right away and I worked on him and he was literally, I was working on him in, in, in the grass and he was ripping the grass out of the ground because it hurts so much for me to get it to unlock, to flood the back with blood and get his body like moving and mobility. And he said he felt blood going down his leg for three days straight and he had never felt that. He went into full blown correction, but look, he could not squat. He's a rock climber. He needs back extension. He needs so most of my rock climbers actually have all have really bad psoas issues and it's the upper end of the psoas and all lat and shoulder stuff that they actually, they have an overextension of all those joints and no muscle to talk about up there, believe it or not, and very, very undeveloped cores. <laughs> Crazy enough. On our right, we got our guy, Julian. Julian was on the table to have a hip replacement, and the surgeon said, go see if I'm pain-free, can fix you before I cut you open. Here's the funny thing. The hip they were coming, he was coming to us for, that they were saying they were going to actually uh, replace, wasn't the issue. It was the other hip. So this is him also learning how to squat. He is a very high-ranking officer. He was, he's a retired high-ranking officer in New York City. He martial arts for many years. He competed in martial arts for many years. So he overly developed one leg and overly moved another leg. And so that imbalance never jived. And voila, we have a hip dysfunction. Well, he went on to become a full runner. He's running right. He's still with us. He's running anytime he wants. And all of his friends keep getting hip replacements and they're all in a lot of pain. And so he's like, I keep telling you, you got to see run pain free. But these are just basic things. Very active people, very athletic people could not squat right. And so that pain happens over and over again. This is the same event with somebody that he had frozen his psoas. He strained his psoas on 
the Brooklyn half, and he went into cryo right after. So this is why we don't we don't do this when we're not million dollar athletes, because uh, he froze his psoas and he actually had no movement in in the in that I believe it was his right leg. He couldn't pick it up at all. So I actually worked on him and I sat on one spot on him with my elbow for about 20 minutes just to get blood moving in the area so he could actually walk again and have a knee drive. But he, that was right after, right before this, right before this actually. And he could not squat. He has no back extension. His hips won't let him sit back. He keeps caving into his knees and I'm literally putting all of my weight into myself so he can leverage it and trust again to sit back. You don't have trust in your body because your spine knows you can't sit. So it disallows the action. So it's not that you're doing it wrong. It's that your body can't do it. We here at Run Pain Free figure out why. That's our job. We are sports biomechanics experts. We know how to figure out why your body isn't working right. So we get it to work right. So here we go to our girl, Latricia. I talked about her in the, in the, in the audio. This is the actual picture of her scar from breaking her, her hip and getting a plate in her femur and six screws in her hip joint. And it was... It was exceptional. It was absolutely exceptional. But again, this is what she was working. She was foam rolling around it. We were getting a lot of juice to it, preventing scar tissue from from happening there so she can move it and move it. And like I said, she was walking without help in just a short few weeks and running a few weeks after that. This is one of her first runs. Um, This happened in March, and this was August. By August, she was already running back at a 930 mile already. And then later on she had got she ran and she got first in her age group. This was an, this was just months after a, a, a hip break, a severe hip break and traumatic surgery. This is where she was at at this point. And so when you if you didn't listen to the audio, go listen to it because it's all spelled out there. But Latricia has a health issue that allows her joints to just keep going and the ligaments don't stop. And so she's prone to, to having too much motion, too much movement. And she was on a run and tripped up her step and her foot went out and uh, everything from there thereafter, even how the EMTs moved her actually it catered to breaking her hip. And so she was able to correct right away and get through it right away. And because of it, she was running very fast with even better mechanics. And she, this, this was, this was February of 23, February of 23. This happened. It is March. I'm recording this in March of 24. She already, she just ran a half marathon yesterday and ran it in a 212. That's slow for her, but she ran it. And this, she's run a lot of 5Ks and 10Ks, and she's been placing in groups months after the surgery. So it's not a, an end all when you're injured. But the, with, when you are doing these basic movements that you would see in a gym, the deadlift is, again, one of the top ones. The deadlift and squat are the basic moves that everybody actually does all day long. You don't even realize it. And all of them are being done wrong. So let's go over it really quickly. See the girl up top with the, with the pink shirt on? She's doing what essentially I think is she's trying to do a stiff leg deadlift. We, I stopped doing stiff leg deadlifts with my clients and myself over a decade ago, well over a decade ago. It's dysfunctional. And some, if you see her back is hunching every time she goes down. So the hunch tells me she can't actually sit into her hips. A proper stiff leg deadlift, you're, whole, you're actually going all the way back and your hips are here and your legs are here and your body is here and it comes up and this. So you can see she doesn't have the extension in her spine, flexion in her spine. She doesn't have the glute support. She actually, her knees are actually bent because she can't, she doesn't have hamstring extension, which is all based on her psoas. Why? I don't treat her. I don't know. I don't treat any of these people that are coming up in this analysis. So I'm just looking at basic movements that I did not have to search that hard for to find bad form. The girl on the right, in the, in, the, in the blue shirt, you can see she's going down. That's called closed chain. Anything that's a bar across the front, both bottom, all that's all closed chain. Um, she actually never stands up fully. If you look at her, she's just hitting, and she's got about 10% left to go. But that's the same position of washing dishes and doing laundry and cooking. Guess what don't like that? So as. So as hates it. So that because she's never standing up fully, she'll never fire her glutes, which is what would have to happen for her back to extend and her and her so as to extend. So she's actually building her back, specifically her lumbar, putting more strain on the spine in an area that's in dysfunction. She's in dysfunction, she's building dysfunction worse. So that's gonna create a herniated disc. That's gonna create 
a bulging disc and it's absolutely going to give her back pain if she's not already in it. The bottom two. Now, the bottom, the one in the middle. Whenever you do closed chain, something else I also stopped a long time ago, you have to come out of form to get it over your knee. It's very minuscule. And honestly, a trained eye is what's going to catch this. I'm sure everybody watching this that doesn't have a trained eye is like, oh, they're in, they're in good form. They're not. None of them on here are in good form. So but the problem with her on the, if you watch, when she goes, when she comes up right there, you could see, if you look at her shoulders, there's a little tick where she comes out and down. Look. Yeah, where she's almost like body rolling a little bit because she doesn't have the extension to get her legs to keep her hips back so she can clear that bar over her knees. Most people don't. Most people don't. So it's just, and I mean, even athletes don't. So, and the heavier, the worse that is because every time she does that, that little itty, in science, millimeters make a life change. So the, the little jerk of trying to get over her knees, that lumbar spine is jarring is doing that every time those the 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 discs and the vertebrae are moving in a way that's jarring and dysfunctional with a lot of load she's got a lot of weight on that thing believe it or not that's some nice little stacked weight she's got going on and now the bottom her knees are bowing out. So the minute her knees bow out, that means her hips are off. If her hips are off, her glutes can't fire. So what's taking that? Her quads. Well, when you build your quads where the psoas comes into inside your hips and the sartorius crosses over, you bulk out the quad. Those two muscles are to our hip flexor muscles and the psoas is, is on the spine. If those two muscles are getting pulled on by a load bulky quad, quad dominant, which most, again, most people have these big dookie quads and nothing in the back. No glute to talk about, no hamstring to talk about. Big old dookie quad. When you have that, you're putting more, the load, the mass pulls you forward. So now you're putting even more pressure on your back. That is not a good strain on the bone to build bone mass. That is strain on the bone to bulge a disc. See the difference? It's not just about form. It's about the function to the form. So when we get to these things, when we look at, I'll go back, when we look at these positions, when we look at this, when that quad keeps building out, it's going to just keep pulling because there's so much more weight, muscle mass forward than there is back. You have to get those things to fire, but it's not just, oh, you're quad dominant, work your butt. Your butt's not firing for a reason. Your back isn't extending for a reason. And a lot of things have to happen for your hips to turn on so they actually flex and extend, for your back to flex and extend in order for your glutes to fire and your hamstrings to extend. And if you don't know what that is, you shouldn't be in a gym working out for no bone density because you're going to go to a gym for an injury instead. So understand that working out is a science. It is a true profession. It is a high level profession. There's a lot of moving parts when it comes to you doing one little itty bitty movement like a deadlift but the and a squat. Most people are doing them wrong consistently over and over and over again and have no idea about it. And that is how you bulge a disc. Stay tuned for my top 10. They're going to be the top 10 movements of how you get injured in a gym. I hope you learned a lot today. Comment below, runpainfreenow.com. Apply for a consult. If you have back pain, don't let it go any further because back and hips, you do not want to feel. You want to feel them in the referred areas, not in those areas. And if you're feeling it there, you're already on our severe list. I will see you soon. And that's the finish line for today's episode. You're not just a runner. You're the key to your healing. Learn how to run stronger after injury at runpainfreenow.com. Until next time, athlete, 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 athlete.